longer shots, maybe it's the best plan to go, let the secondary bang away and try to get some points up right out, right out the gates and right. go from there. So. All right, so we just got done with stage two. I'd probably say it was probably the most frustrating stage Saz and I have ever had, ever, in all of shooting. I agree. <laughs> uh, well, it's supposed to forecast right now is calling for rain from like six to nine. We changed our strategy this morning and we actually ran downhill and then maintained our same pace when walking, even uphill. Uh, so that's pretty good. Yep. Today was fun, like we got our legs underneath us, we knew what to expect today. Meaning of uh, day three, final morning. How are you feeling? I'm sore. Yeah. Alright, 35 left. So I'm excited to go back and shoot. I'm definitely excited that we qualified for nationals. We, we're going to go to nationals. Well, I'm saying we're going. Chris hasn't really committed yet, but pretty sure he will. Pretty sure. Yep. So he, you guys got it. He just committed. We're going to nationals for sure. I don't even know where to start when it comes to the Vortex Sniper Challenge. If we just break it down on how the matches ran, I think it was ran extremely well very happy with it and it was a lot of fun the stages were laid out very well and the ro's that were on that stage understood the game plan and the stage design better than any other match i've ever been to and they had been briefed every morning on their very on their particular stage on what they could and couldn't say so it's a blind stage i walk up to it or actually blind stage they put you in a holding area, the RO comes over and he reads the stage description to you twice. And then they put a timer on and you have five minutes, all the teams together have five minutes to ask questions on trying to game the stage. And now remember, you cannot see the stage. And in that five minutes, you can ask questions and the ROs are already predicting you to ask certain questions and they will shut you down on certain questions. And I, I haven't been to a match that was ran that well forever. So Vortex Sniper Challenge definitely has that going for them. Fantastic. The pistol, amount of pistol shooting that happened at the Vortex Sniper Challenge was, it blew my mind. I, there were 12 stages and we shot pistol on eight of those stages. So, if you're not good at pistol, I definitely recommend getting to the range and working on your pistol shooting if you're looking at shooting the Vortex Sniper Challenge. If you don't, you're throwing away free points. If you're good at shooting pistol, it really sucks when you miss a target, and I did. If you're good at pistol shooting, you're going to love it. There's a lot of it. Um, and I think the farthest shot we shot out, or the target we shot at with the pistol is close to 100 yards, so they're not easy targets and they're worth four points per target, so you've really got to work on that. Now, getting into the rifle shooting, it was kind of what I expected. Um, none of the targets were painted, which is awesome. We had a left marker and a right, right marker, and when you get up there, all your targets are in between these markers. I've shot that before, so not a big deal, but Sometimes some of the matches I've seen and shot at, like your markers are put like this, so they're pretty narrow and they'll just run them out far. This match, I think there was one stage that it was like 160 degrees. So I mean, they were, they were like this and there's a lot of panning. And that's fantastic, especially when you got to get out there on your spotting scope, work with your partner, and you have to pan 160 degrees roughly to make sure you spot your targets, range your targets, and engage your targets. And you have eight minutes to do that for both of you. It's pretty cool. Uh, each stage had different style targets, so uh, stage one, I was shooting diamonds for secondary, and primary was shooting squares. Uh, stage two, I think I was shooting sniper heads, and primary was shooting diamonds. So every stage you get to, they had a, a piece of two by four stuck in the ground, or like a, a lath or something like that, stuck in the ground, and they had cut out the targets to give you an idea of what you were shooting, and each target had a P on it for primary or it had an S on it for secondary. So 
you had the entire time you were staging to really look at that target to know exactly what you were shooting. Like I said, all targets were gray. They were unknown distance. Nobody knew where they were. All the stages were blind. So you start in a staging area. They call your team. You go up to an area, and it was roughly anywhere from 50 yards to 100 yard run to where the actual stage started. And they would let you know, like primary has to shoot pistol first, then secondary. But when you get to the rifle, whoever wants to shoot first can. Or sometimes it'd be primary has to shoot first. Uh, stage one did great. Stage two, Chris and I completely broke down in everything that we've known to do and trained on went out the door. It was gone. And I think we didn't even talk to each other for like first 20 minutes when we came off that stage. And it was just the simple fact of you get up there and there's just target. There, sometimes there's targets everywhere and there's two targets right out in the middle of the field. And Chris and I had actually separated ourselves a little bit too far. And we were about two feet apart from each other in the back of this military truck. And Chris's middle of the field, it was different than my middle of the field. And there were two of my targets out there. And the first target I saw that would look like it was in the middle of the field to me was not the target he had ranged. So as he's trying to talk me onto a target, he also has to talk the RO onto Red a target. Red six outer and the inner's a uh, gray square. Go ahead. They're not gonna just let you shoot a target and call impact because they see it. You literally have to talk everybody that's on, supposed to be looking for those targets onto the target. So we, our communication broke down there uh, during our, our ruck or middle ruck for that day we talked about it we learned uh we we put some game plans together and that started to build the foundation we were able to build off for the rest of the match which was fantastic um, but day one we shot four mat four stages day two we shot four stages and day three we fought, uh, shot four stages so uh love the way it was laid out it is more like a um like a PRS style or a three gun USPSA style where you travel, everybody travels with their squad to each stage. Um, now you do have rucks going to each one. So if you don't make the time, you're not done with the match, but you do get moved to mechanized. And so you're not traveling with the squad anymore, but they'll drive you to each stage. When you get to your stage after the ruck or after your small movement, you have to sit there until it's your time. So if you're, you're shooting, you're in the fifth team shooting, each squad gets eight minutes, that so you have plenty of time to sit there because you're the fifth squad called in, and then you have to wait till everybody else is done. That would be my only complaint about this match, and, and that's just because I like to go from stage to stage to stage and shoot as many stages as I can in a day. I think that's great. I love it. My attention span actually starts to go out. The, you know, like It just disappears if I have to sit on a stage and just wait. So there's a lot of time to think there and to work through the stages of what you think is going to happen with your partner and then even to just kick back, take a nap. So those are stages. Now let's get into the ruck. We knew, I knew, Chris knew, everybody that's looked into these matches know there's going to be a rucking, but I had no idea what I was actually signing up for. Day one, we get there. We, we ruck out at like 7 a.m. and we have a 4.8 mile ruck to our first stage. And we had like 86 minutes to get there. And that sounds super easy. And we ruck, we just tried to keep pace. We, met, we averaged like a 16, 23 pace, but there were some pretty good hills there. That drops your pace down to close, you know, back into the 17s. And then there's some downhills, which would help. But day one sucked. The rucking part was absolutely horrible. I think we rucked over 14 miles. It was closer to 15 miles on day one. And on the end of day one, when we're rucking out, we're two miles into the, the last ruck, because coming out, we had 4.5 miles to ruck. So we're coming out two miles into it. So we still have about two and a half miles to go. We have to go through a river. Water comes up over the top of my boots, goes into my boots, and I'm wearing some danners, and they do not let water in. So it means they're not letting water out. So all the water was absorbed by my socks. And as I'm walking the last two and a half miles, I can feel blisters. And that mentally starts to beat me down because I'm like, dude, this is rock. It's horrible. It's miserable. Don't like it. My feet are starting to get blisters. What is this going to look like tomorrow? What's this going to look like on Sunday? So those were a lot of my fears that were going on. But it's also just the mental aspect. 
four and a half miles with carrying 60 plus pounds on your back that's not a frame backpack will mentally start to get to you. Not having the proper amount of nutrition will get to you. Uh, hydration starts to get to you. So there's a lot of stuff that you have to really just mentally get the through. Back end from our stage. Cool. So. so having the lack of all of that definitely brings me into gear. And this was the biggest failure when it came to the match for Chris and I. So nothing against Everly Stock. Run, I have a couple of their bags, love them. This bag works great for hunting. I have another bag that works great for hunting. But the G3 Phantom will not be on my back at any more Vortex Sniper Challenge matches. It was rough, it was brutal. And you know, I'd been told to run a frame style pack Chris and I looked into them. They're expensive. If we put the money into the wrong pack, we were really worried about that. So we decided to run the same pack, and we were going to go to the match and shoot. So we both ran the Everly stock bags. We went to the match, and we were just getting ready to watch everybody's stuff. So our packs were not geared or not frame style, and we packed them light on the bottom, heavy to the top, and they just... Honestly, they were horrible. It, it just no matter how we had them set up, I messed with my setup multiple times, never could get comfortable behind them. So we are looking at other packs right now with frame styles. We definitely will have some by the next match we go to. We're getting matching packs because we want all of our gear to match so we can pack out the same. Now, another thing, we just bought a lot of snacks. We had no idea how long we were gonna be out there. And on day one, we were out there for almost 14 hours. Living off of Pop-Tarts, crackers, and freaking Sour Patch Kids and gummy worms are not what we needed. And that really kicked in on the end of day one. And it, that really set the stage for the rest of the, the week. I mean, we, there was no way we could get caught up with recovery that we needed in the short amount of time that we had from that. When I talked to Ben Fleener, he talked about taping hot spots in your boots. And you should. Now, my feet were doing great. Like I said, I knew my boots. I've wore these boots in matches before. I've, I've, I've done some smaller rucks with them in, in the past. Love them. Had no issues until my feet got wet walking through the river. And that's when I had to change my entire game plan. So on day two, uh, which was Saturday, I took, I think, eight pairs of socks and a bunch of Band-Aids. And in, you know... Day two, we started out with a 4.8 mile ruck. Like we had to go back through the river. And then like fell off, so when I got to the very first stage, I pulled my boots off, pulled my socks off, started letting my feet air out in between every ruck or every stage I was at. So I would sit there with my feet out, letting them air out, and then I would put fresh band-aids over, over the blister. I never popped the blisters, I would just put band-aids over the top of them. Oh, that's right. Letting your feet air out on every stage is a must. Now, like I said, we talked about bags. The bags were not laid out the way they should have been. But my rifle, when I weighed my rifle before the match, it weighed in at about 15 pounds. I wasn't worried about that. I, you know, my MR19 weighed 19 pounds. I carried it around at BSRs, you know, competition dynamics, no problem. So it's like 19 pounds, not a big deal. If you've seen my rifle before, you can tell now that my rifle is set up different. I had weights on here. Those weights after the match are no longer on there. And I went from the PRS 3 stock to the new PRS light stock. Now each one of those brought some weight down and though the stock only dropped 10 ounces in the stock itself, when I got rid of the rifle link buffer tube and I got rid of the spacer that was sitting behind my JP SES, dropped a lot of weight. So, my rifle now weighs 13 pounds, four ounces. So dropped over a pound and a half, and I will be honest with you, ounces equal pounds in this game. When you rock over 40 miles in three days, you want as much weight to be cut as possible. So Eberly stock weighs eight pounds. The packs we're looking at now with the straps, the frame, and the pack weigh four pounds. I think they're like four pounds, eight ounces. My tripod, love my tripod, love my tripod. Last year I ran a, um, I didn't, well last year I didn't run this ball head. I ran a leveling head. I went to the ball head this year because I was like, I want to have a lot more range of motion. 
When I have the ball head on here, this tripod weighs about seven pounds. Not a whole lot, but it started to add up over the 40 miles, so I'm getting rid of the ball head and I'm going back to the leveling head. Chris is gonna keep the ball head, I believe, on his tripod, so that way him and I will have one tripod with a leveling head, and if we need to throw binoculars on there, if we need to shoot off of it, we need more range of motion, we can mess with the feet, or we can throw you know, these, these bags, these wee bad bags up on top. But we need, we're trying to cut down as much weight as possible. So going into day three, I think I took the range finders and the bag and the tripod without the ball head. Chris went with the, his complete tripod, ball head tripod, but he left his range finding binoculars at home or at the hotel. What we, we were trying to cut weight everywhere we can. We even started trying to cut weight on mags that we carry. We're like, we'll just reload each mag in between stages. Anything we could do to cut weight is what we were doing. Now that did come back to bite us on the butt because the very last stage of the match, for us, you had to be separated. It's only one, you know, like you could not trade gear. So Saz was up above me in a little tree house. I was on the ground and I could barely hear him and he had the range finders and he was trying to range my targets and call out to me. So we will be, both be carrying our, our range finder binoculars, the Furies, we're both gonna carry those. Uh, so if any time, at any point, we need a range for ourselves, we will. I would love to tell you guys, like, hey, this is what works, and this is what you should do. But at that match, every team I looked at, all the gear that they had, not everything's the same. The only thing that was pretty similar are the packs. Outside of that, everybody's running something different. So if you're looking at doing this, my, my suggestion to you is you either shoot trooper or you shoot mechanized. What that does for you is that, Trooper is going to give you the rucking satisfaction of that. It's going to give you that hard part, that mental part of like, will this work? Will this pack work for me? But you don't have to stay the night, so you can start to try to figure out your gear and what weight you want to do. If you're unsure about all of that, and you just want to go out and shoot a fun match, a lot of pistols, some hard rifle targets, and try to get a feel of what everything else looks like, then there's mechanized. And mechanized... You're, they're going to put you in a, a vehicle and they're going to drive where they can. Now, Missouri mechanized didn't work out that way because it rained and they some of the equipment couldn't get to the stages, to the drop-off point. So mechanized did have to, to rock a little bit more than they wanted to. But overall, those would be the two divisions I would start out with. Now, if you're a hunter or you've done military time and you know how you like your gear and you know everything, then, then the LARP division may be for you and you can just jump in there. All right, so we're discussing game Hopefully in December, <laughs> we're going to go to Nationals in the Trooper Division, and hopefully we can compete and finish at, at, a, at a high spot, right? I, I'd love to come out of there in the top three. I'd even be happy coming out of there in the top five. We'll just see how it goes. We've got a lot of matches that we're going to learn a lot more, so my, my goals and my hopes for us as a team is just going to get that much better. Now that we've got our rifles dialed in, we've got ammo figured out. So, yeah, I mean, Vortex Sniper Challenge... If it's not on your bucket list, put it on your bucket list. Give them a follow on all their social medias. They're on Instagram um, under Vortex Sniper Challenge, on Facebook under the same thing. You can also find them at vortex.com on the website. Be sure to follow JP on all their social media platforms. Like, comment, subscribe. And I'll see you guys at the range.